Forgive me, I'm going to stand over here and um, try and talk uh, outside of the lectern. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here tonight, and thank you so much for coming along, um, and particular thanks to Fenella Kernerbone for that incredibly generous introduction. What I'm going to share with you tonight is the very first findings of a three-year study into mobile and social media use in Australia by 18 to 30-year-olds. It's currently the biggest study that's been conducted in this field. I'm hoping that by sharing some of these findings with you, we can start to answer this question, which is a very big question, about how mobile and social media are changing us. So what I'm going to do, rather than jump right into the future of technology, is actually jump to 1963. This comes from the Seattle World's Fair. And I'll let her explain exactly what this technology is all about. Hi, this is the Bell Systems new touch tone dial. With this indicator, you see how many seconds you save the new way. Let's try it. Okay, I'll race you. Ready? Go. <laughs> So as we can see, finally it worked, um, that the most pressing new media technology question in 1963 was, will the push-button telephone make dialing faster? And indeed, we can already see from this point that young people are front and centre in the frame. And this concatenation between young people, telephony and new technologies is still very present with us today, as we're going to see tonight. But as you can see from this picture, from, oh, that's an interesting microphone dropout. Um, as you can see, this is actually the very first ever magazine spread about the touchtone telephone. And I'm trying to imagine what it would look like if we tried to come up with a magazine spread in popular electronics about how we access technology today from our phones. I think it might look a little bit like this, <laughs> where we see Facebook, the striking, miraculous social team-up. And the sets of technologies that we're so familiar with accessing every day from our mobile phones. Right now, I think, certainly for me, is a fascinating time to be studying mobile technology. This is the first year where mobiles actually went past the 5 billion subscription mark worldwide. And in Australia, there are actually more mobile phones than there are people. We're currently sitting at around 115% mobile phone penetration. So what does this mean in terms of how we actually engage with phones? Well, if you look at the data here, you'll find that while there are 5 billion phone subscriptions, only 1 billion are currently connected to the internet. But that's the number that is going up at the greatest rate. The number that's decreasing the most is the one at the bottom, which is the number of internet users who don't currently have a phone with internet access. So what I believe we're seeing here is one of the most extraordinary metamorphoses of technology in the last 50 years. We've moved from mobile communications to mobile media. What this means for us is that rather than just using the phone as a place where we're receiving and making calls, it's become a media hub where a series of key media activities are going on every day. So when we're seeing somebody walking down the street holding a mobile phone, rather than necessarily dialing a number or about to receive a call, they might be looking at a photograph, they could be listening to music, they might be uploading something to their Twitter account, they could be playing games, they could be using a location service like Foursquare, updating where they are in a city, or they could be using an augmented reality app. Uh, for example, this week they released Plane Finder, which is an application where you can hold up your iPhone at any plane in the sky and it will be able to tell you the number of that plane and whether or not it's running on schedule. So these sorts of extraordinary technologies couldn't be imagined as recently as five years ago, are helping us navigate cities differently, navigate our social lives differently, and our professional lives. But there's something also really interesting going on here, and in my research, one thing that I'm very interested in is how phones act as listening portals. So rather than just being broadcast technologies, what's really common and certainly verified in our study is that people are constantly just using the phone for checking in moments, tuning in to the multiple broadcasts from their friends and family over Twitter and Facebook and text messaging. 
So it becomes like a set of radio channels that you can experience over the course of a day. And this, I think, has been quite a profound shift in terms of how we understand mobile telephony. But let me tell you a little bit about the study itself. It's an Australian Research Council discovery grant. It's called Young Mobile Network. And it's been running from 2008 and finishes in the first half of 2011. And I've been conducting this study with my colleagues, Professor Jared Goggin and Dr. Carolyn Hamilton. And at the moment, it's the largest study. It's using both qualitative and quantitative techniques. We've just finished the qualitative work, so that's what I'll be sharing with you tonight. And we've been interviewing 18 to 30-year-olds. This group was particularly interesting to us because they're the biggest users of mobile internet at the moment, particularly using things like Facebook and Twitter. But also because of my previous work in books like Adult Themes, this is a group which is very much used as a kind of optic, as a focus through which particular social concerns are worked through. That it's by looking at this group and in some, to some degree, pathologizing this group that we see very key debates playing out around technology. So how did we do it? Well, we started out, first of all, by thinking about the kinds of imaginaries that circulate around both youth culture and technology. So we did this by looking at the ways in which this age group are represented in the media, but also the sorts of panics that circulate around them as well. And then we wanted to compare it to the lived realities of how these technologies were being used. What role do mobiles play in friendship? Clearly, this was a key question that hasn't been answered by previous research. But we're also really interested in how mobiles are used as emotional technologies. Zoe Sofoulis, the cultural theorist, has this lovely term of the container technology. And I think in a lot of ways, the mobile acts as a kind of emotional container. It might have a set of photographs that you feel particularly attached to or text messages from a significant other, but it also acts as a conduit through which people receive and send particular kinds and forms of emotional attachment. I think it's important to keep in mind as I share these findings today about just how recent these technologies are. The mobile phone's been around for 35 years. It's been popularized for considerably less time than that. But if we look at the social media space, uh, MySpace has been around for seven years, Facebook for six, and Twitter for just four years. And if we think about the extraordinary change that's been brought about by these particular platforms, it's remarkable to look at a map like this to see the sorts of numbers of people who are currently using them. And like this map, it's quite a lovely illustration, I think it reminds us that each one of these services is like its own culture, its own country with customs and languages and ways of communicating with others. And here we see that Facebook is now past the 500 million mark and Twitter is now past 114 million users. So to the specifics. In 2009, we conducted the field work, which meant getting in a van and driving around the country um, and what we did was we interviewed people in both one-on-one -on -one interviews and focus groups, and we reached 339 people around Australia. Pretty much evenly balanced between men and women, and we particularly wanted to reach people living in very different sorts of situations, so not just talking to people who live in the big cities, but also going out to regional centres and remote rural towns. So we ended up going to five locations across four states, Sydney, Lismore, Gold Coast, Port Augusta, and Melbourne. And I just want to share with you one photograph from the field work. And this came when we were just driving out of the Flinders Ranges in the middle of nowhere. The nearest town is about 150 clicks from this. And here we are, suddenly in the middle of nowhere, a sign alerts us to the fact that this is a mobile phone area. We don't have to panic. Thank heavens. And this, I think, is a testament to the kinds of uses of the mobile phone that has become such an uh, integral and central technology that even in the middle of the wilds, in the middle of the desert, we have to be informed that indeed this is a mobile phone area. So to the findings. The primary finding is very similar to a lot of the international studies of the mobile. It is a ubiquitous, structuring technology that people use all the time. The theorist Rich Ling has used the term micro-coordination about the ways in which the mobile is used to arrange our social lives and our professional lives. And this was a key use of the mobile for all of the people that we spoke to. Interestingly, the phone is now something we never turn off. It's a constant network presence. One of the people that I spoke to in the field work admitted that she'd caught a plane recently and she was asked to turn her phone off 
and she'd completely forgotten how to do it. She was so used to having this phone on all the time, she could put it into silent, but she had completely forgotten that the machine could actually be turned off. And this was not an unusual experience. But what is interesting here is that the phone is no longer about making and receiving calls. In fact, this was the least preferred mode of communication for the 18 to 30 year olds that we spoke to. They were much more interested in using the phone to send text messages, to send Twitter and Facebook messages. These are so-called light touch forms of communication. And I think this often gets misread in that we hear that young people are forgetting the art of face-to-face -face conversation. But actually what we found is that people are using these so-called asynchronous modes because it's deemed to be more polite. That by sending out a message, someone can reply to you in their own time rather than being interrupted by a phone call. And this is actually a very clever adaptation rather than necessarily a kind of social anxiety. However, I'd like to question this term light touch because many of the people that we spoke to were receiving dozens of these messages every day, in some cases over a hundred messages in a day. So we have to start asking just how light is this kind of touch? And in actual fact, what was very clear is that there were growing pressures on attention for all of the people who were dependent on mobile and social media. What I'd like to do later tonight is unpack this word attention a little and to turn to what we know through media studies and cultural studies and also media history to think about the way in which attention changes, changes over time. That this term that we use, that we think we all understand, has a fascinating media history. But before we get there, I'd like to show you four of the key structuring popular imaginaries that we wanted to consider in this study. These are the sorts of discourses that were being used in newspapers, in TV, in popular debates, and also in policy discussions. So the first one, which was very present when we started this study, is that young people are supposedly technophiles. They love technology, they're obsessed with technology, they have to have the latest phones, they know everything about how the phone platform works, but they know nothing about the financial cost. They don't care about the cost and quite frequently run up considerable debt. Well, what we found was quite contrary to this. Uh, many of the people that we spoke to under the age of 22 were still living at home. And if they were living outside of home, they had quite limited economic means. And because of this, they were extraordinarily sensitive to the cost of using things like mobile media. If they were checking something on YouTube, they knew that it was going to go over their data plans. In fact, to such an extent that some of the people we spoke to are choosing not to get 3G phones. Because as this respondent said, I'd just be wasting my time checking Facebook all day. I do that enough as it is. But interestingly, it was the cost question which was most important. So another respondent admitted that in actual fact, she might occasionally Facebook up a storm, but that it could cost her an arm and a leg. So it became very much a question of a luxury product, that they would occasionally do this, but it was very much a rarity. What was also interesting about this was that young people had a very interesting kind of class politics circulating around mobile phones. Particularly for the under 22s, if they saw somebody with an iPhone, the assumption was, well, either this person thinks they're very important or mummy and daddy is giving them a lot of money. And so this came up quite a lot in our interviews, that the iPhone as a kind of a status object was being undercut. It was actually seen as somebody who is far too subject to the kind of marketing rhetorics that are focused at young people. The other thing that was really interesting is the return of the retro phone. And this was something that came up quite frequently uh, in the urban areas, that if you could have an old school phone, say a Nokia from the early 2000s, this was deemed to be much hipper than if you had an Android or an iPhone. I think possibly this is because in many cases it indicated that you're the sort of person who's not going to be completely seduced by the latest iPhone 4 campaign and that you could actually find retro technology to be quite hip and quite cool. So the second social imaginary uh, that I think is particularly fascinating is that young people have somehow forgotten the value of true friendship. This has been the subject of a couple of features, one in the New York Times recently and another in a couple of Australian newspapers. Commonly, oh, there we go, quite commonly misunderstood, I think, that because you can make friends on Facebook with the click of a button, that friendship has somehow been accorded less weight, that is not seen to be something of lasting value. Well, what we found was that the people we spoke to have an extraordinarily complex, granular understanding of different sorts of types and genres of friendship. 
And this was interesting because so many of these forms of friendship, such as Facebook friends and Twitter friends, simply didn't exist 10 years ago. So we have a cohort who are navigating totally new spaces, but they're not equating them as being the same kind of friendship. On the contrary, they were seeing them as quite different sorts of association. In some cases, such as with this respondent, the difference between a phone contact list and your Facebook friends was complete. In fact, for her, they were totally different worlds. So this idea of Facebook friends has also, as we can see, become quite culturally popular as a way to explain a kind of friendship that isn't particularly real or isn't particularly genuine and lasting. Now, this doesn't mean that people on Facebook aren't your real friends, but rather that there were gradations of friendship that were circulating in these particular spaces. What was also interesting is the way in which people understood a difference between the kinds of friendship intimacy you could experience on a site like Twitter and a service like Facebook. As this respondent said, she really enjoys the weird intimacy of Twitter because often with these people you like them and you want to be their friend, but you don't ever have those sorts of interactions with them in real life. So you feel like they're letting you into your world a bit and that's quite good. Whereas with Facebook, what was much more common was that people had an experience of making friends with, say, their high school buddies or the people that they work with. That Twitter provided a kind of friendship space where you could feel attached and connected with people that you didn't really know. In fact, Lisa Reichelt is the theorist who first coined the term ambient intimacy, and I think it's a really good way of encapsulating how services like Twitter work. So overall, what we found was that the people we spoke to were extraordinarily literate about friendship, and they could talk about different kinds of friendship and different ways of engaging friends in certain spaces. But above all, the most highly prized thing was time spent face to face, and that the way in which people would discuss their real friends were the ones that they would go to the pub with, go to a gig with, or hang out with a cafe. This is, this is not amazing news to many of us, but I think unfortunately this is the sort of story that doesn't get told when we hear that young people are forgetting how real friendship works. The third social imaginary, I think, is one around privacy that's very key at the moment. That somehow young people don't really value privacy and that we've got some very particular limit cases, such as sexting, to look at as examples of why privacy now no longer has the same valency that it once did. And this is interesting because I've just been working uh, in Boston with Dana Boyd, who's based at Microsoft Research Labs. And she, I think, is one of the most interesting thinkers right now doing research into young people and privacy and how they're actually engaging with all of the different sorts of spaces that are on offer. What she's been finding, and certainly was very much confirmed with what we were looking at in our study, was that young people care passionately about privacy. And they want to have control over what goes into public space and what stays in private space but that in many cases they were working with services that were trying to push them into a more public relation. One of the really common cases that gets cited here, of course, is Facebook changing its privacy regulations at the end of 2009. Facebook decided in its wisdom to say that you could decide how much you'd like to have on, you know, in the public view, but the default setting was that everybody could see everything. So unless you were the kind of person who spends a lot of time looking at your privacy settings, that suddenly you would find that your party photos, all of these sort of private moments that you had in your Facebook account were suddenly public. And the people that we spoke to were incredibly angry, and I think rightly angry about this. But what's also interesting about privacy is that this idea that there is a binary between public and private, I think, has really changed. In fact, the number of grey areas between what we're prepared to share with particular audiences but not others has become highly sophisticated in these spaces. And again, what we saw was a very impressive level of literacy around how to negotiate what should be made public and what should not be made public. But perhaps the biggest scandal in this area at the moment is around sexting. Has everybody here heard of the term sexting? No, okay, well, sexting is a portmanteau term uh, joining sex and texting. And sexting has become very much a kind of cultural panic in recent years. It's been the subject of shows on Gossip Girl, on Law and Order. Uh, the Washington Post ran a very large feature about this being the latest youth trend. What's interesting about this is that a study came out in the US last year indicating that one in five teenagers have sent a sexually explicit image of themselves via mobile phone. And we thought this would be very interesting to get some data about the Australian experience. 
to date, there hasn't been any large study looking at sexting practices in Australia. So as part of our study, we thought we'd ask people if this is something that they engaged in. And it was very interesting. First of all, it was far less common than the US study would have indicated. Uh, many people said that they'd heard about it, and perhaps they knew friends who had occasionally received dirty images, but that they were not actually engaging in this. But what was interesting is that people tended to fall into one of two camps. On one side was the belief that sexting just doesn't work very well. So if we look at uh, this particular male respondent talking about himself and his partner, <laughs> didn't really want to engage in sexting because he didn't want to send something that looks like deep sea life. And uh, again, this was quite common that people thought, look, it's really not that attractive. On the other side, we had people who were engaging in sexting and were quite open and talking about it with us as just another way of forming connections with their partners. This was particularly common with people who had partners who were living interstate or internationally, that it was a really important way of maintaining particular kinds of intimacy that you couldn't just have with words. What was most important, though, in what we found is that everybody that we spoke to had no idea of the level of legal seriousness that applies to sending sexual text messages. This from one interview. We asked whether or not they were aware that there were severe legal penalties for under 18 sending sexual images via phone. And as you can see, these two guys said, what, for taking photos of themselves? It's ridiculous. Isn't it a matter of consent? And his friend replies, it's absolutely what the mobile is meant for. <laughs> Perhaps a little glib, but nonetheless, I think it was very much evidenced across the board that people thought that this was something that you do for fun, sometimes in the context of bonding, sometimes in the context of a sexual relationship, but not something that would be leaving you open to potential child pornography charges, which is currently the state of play, both here and in the US. Let me give you an example. Last year, three 15-year-old girls were having a sleepover party and they decided to take racy, semi-naked photos of themselves and send it to three boys that they liked at school. When this was discovered, the three girls were charged with the production and distribution of child pornography and the boys were charged with possession of child pornography. This was a very serious charge and it's not a limit case. This has happened frequently since that time. What we're seeing now is this unfortunate combination of what is occurring quite commonly in teen lives with mobiles and a very serious legal charge. In Australia, we saw a similar case with a 13-year-old girl who sent a picture of her underpants to her boyfriend. And again, this was brought up as a potential cause of a child pornography charge. And what happens here is that if you are in fact charged with a production of child pornography, you're put on the sex offenders register. And this is a charge that will live with you for the rest of your life. So it's extremely serious. And certainly one of the things in our study that I think has made it clear to us that something needs to change in terms of the laws in Australia. The last social imaginary that I'd like to share with you tonight is that young people love being overconnected. That when we see people on the bus, people at, at cafes talking to their friends, everybody's on mobiles, everybody's texting, that this is something that is genuinely enjoyed, that is a pleasure, and that people are in fact quasi addicted to this experience of being constantly overconnected. For example, one of our respondents said, my phone is not usually more than like three meters from me at all times. I'll even admit taking it to the bathroom with me. When I'm gonna have a shower, I'll have it on the bench. It's so sad. It's under my pillow when I sleep. You may laugh, but the Pew Internet Survey in the US has now revealed that 95% of people under the age of 30 sleep with their phone right next to them or under their pillow. And for those of you who might be feeling a bit older and like, well, I'm, I'm clearly not going to be doing that, for the 50-plus cohort, that number drops to 60%. <laughs> so the phone is very much with us. It is an extraordinary, intimate, affective technology that is biased at all times. But I think what you can also see in that quote is a kind of ambiguous relationship to this kind of dependency. I think we can hear a kind of sadness and a kind of concern about what this dependency might mean. One of the respondents I spoke to told me a story about being trapped in an elevator for six hours. And the reason that she had such a vivid recall of this moment was that she had no phone access for six hours. And that she said by far and away, 
the most distressing part of this was not a concern for her physical safety or that the elevator might collapse, but that she couldn't check Facebook and she couldn't receive any texts and she couldn't find out what her friends were doing and that this experience of being forcibly off network was extremely distressing. In fact, this was such a, a common story of people being very distressed if they couldn't actually make contact via their phone that I think we can define it as a kind of connectivity panic, a very common experience that I think people in this room might recognise if you've ever had your phone go missing or get stolen, that this experience of not being able to reach people is actually very distressing. However, we're also seeing norms emerge around when is it okay to be using your phone and when is it not okay. And these kinds of normative structures are forming in friendship groups, which is why we were so interested in studying friendship groups for this particular study. As we can hear in the voices of these two respondents, uh, one woman is very distressed that every time they go to gigs and concerts, people are taking photos and uploading things to their Twitter and Facebook accounts. It's like, you paid money to come in here, what are you doing? And her friend replies, or when people go on holidays and they're there, they're already uploading to Facebook from their iPhones. What I think we hear is a kind of association between what is all right with our usage and what is not all right. And this was very common in all of the people that we spoke to. There are other ways that these norms are developing. This is a somewhat more uh, brutal kind um, from a cafe in Fitzroy where, in fact, talking about Facebook is now strictly prohibited. And while this might seem funny, I think it's a lovely manifestation of that kind of normative construction that is going on as we speak around mobile usage. I'd like to say a few words now about one of the distinctions we notice between our urban and our rural populations. For our urban users, for whom being connected was so important, a couple of minutes of downtime was a source of distress and anger and irritation. We had lots of people swearing about their mobile providers, like, oh, it's ridiculous, I have minutes where I'm not actually being able to reach the network every day. Whereas with our rural populations, we found something quite different. They had a far more laissez-faire attitude about being off network and in fact, in many ways, were actually coming up with hacks in terms of how they could deal with network outages. Of course, in a lot of regional and rural Australia, coverage is very poor. But rather than this being a source of anger, people were finding ways of working around it. So they would use burst communication, saving up all of their text messages and their, their Twitter messages to a moment when they had network. But even more interestingly to me, they were f using this period of being off network as a way to be uncontactable, that they had a permanent excuse where they could say, oh, look, you know, I was driving down that road, you know, the one, there's, there's no mobile access there, it's terrible. But this was actually quite a clever way of being, allowing yourself to be off network. And I think this is an important question when we start to address the idea of attention and overconnection with the mobile. And I'd like to turn to this in a little more detail to think about the current debates around mobile media and attention. It is getting a lot of coverage at the moment. In fact, if anybody was listening to AM this morning, you would have heard uh, a discussion about whether or not the internet is making us stupid. Because of course, there's theoretically a cognitive deficit which is created by all of these input channels, all of these forms of distraction. What I'd like to do is think about this debate as more or less falling into two camps. On one side, we have the people who believe that technology is a problem, that there was a, a more glorious time before we had phones, before social media, where we were not being distracted, where we had perfect attention. This is, if you like, the myth of the fall model of media history, that there was this time in the Garden of Eden where things were much simpler. And the sort of people who I think use this kind of information overload argument are Nicholas Carr, and Jaron Lanier, who've both written quite popular technology books. One is called You Are Not a Gadget, and the other, The Shallows. Why the internet is indeed making us stupid. But it's not just popular technology books. It's also appearing in political philosophy. And Giorgio Agamben, in a 2006 essay called What is an Apparatus, gives one of the most visceral descriptions of his hatred of the mobile phone. And he describes his hatred as being based on the fact that mobile phones are making the relationship between people ever more abstract. And in particular, he talks about the way that the mobile phone is changing human gesture, that the very body of his Italian friends and nearest and dearest, the bodies were changing because of the mobile phone. And while I think this is an interesting point, I don't think it actually tells us the full story. Because in actual fact, the mobile phone is just the latest in a long tradition of technologies where these sorts of complaints have been made. 
Walter Benjamin, back in 1932, wrote about the landline telephone as being something that he thought was both uncanny and violent because it separated the human voice from the physical body. And it also allowed the outside public space to essentially enter the private sphere and enter the home. And his view was that above all, what the landline did is that it made us particular kinds of disciplinary subjects where if the phone rang, we had to answer and that this was the beginning of a whole lot of problems. Let me give you this quote from one of his this beautiful essay. The telephone disturbed not only my parents' afternoon nap, but the world historical epoch in whose middle they dwelled. And of course, radio was another technology which was seen to be extremely powerful and possibly quite dangerous. In the 1930s, the radio was seen as, as a tool of propaganda and that the greatest risk was being a distracted listener. This is something that the historian David Goodman has covered in, in spectacular detail. But that to be a distracted listener would leave you open to forms of propaganda and that the radio had to be carefully controlled. On the other side, the other camp, we have the technology is the solution group. And I have to say, I don't have much truck with this group either. Um, possibly the most well-known uh, advocate is Clay Shirky, who has come up with a much quoted aphorism that there is no such thing as information overload, there's only filter failure. So that should make you all feel better. Um, and of course we can see this similar kind of desire to find tools and tricks to make everything better in sites like Lifehacker, which is about increasing your productivity, the Getting Things Done program, or as Merlin Mann describes it on 42 folders, productivity porn. And what's very interesting about the emergence of productivity porn is that it seeks to find a kind of prosthesis in technology, that the right piece of software or the right management program will turn us into highly efficient individuals who are brilliant at work, fantastic at play, wonderful at maintaining our family and friendship relationships. But in actual fact, I think this is highly problematic, not only because it's hyper-individualized, but it fails to look at the broader social problems and social issues that are connected to these kinds of technologies and the sorts of expectations that we all have to be using these technologies all the time. But I would like to throw out a provocation tonight. And my provocation to you is that total focus was in fact never possible, nor is it actually desirable. And that in these debates about mobiles and social media interrupting us, that we're alluding to a time that never existed. That in actual fact, technology has always interrupted us and there has always been too much to know. If we go back to the Library of Alexandria in the third century, at that point, there was too many books for one person to read in a human lifetime. Even then, we had a point where there was simply too much information. And I think in many ways, this is what we can learn from using a media history approach is understanding the big scope of how attention changes over time. I'd like to give you one example from 1906 with the spectacularly named Society for the Suppression of Unnecessary Noise. Lovely name. Uh, this society was set up by Julia Barnett Rice in New York. Uh, she had considerable social sway, she knew all the right people, and she drew on this social capital to get Mark Twain to be honorary president, and then to agitate for what she called quiet zones or protective circles that would be used in New York to protect vulnerable populations, by which she meant children, the elderly, and the sick. So what they did is they fought to get these protective circles around hospitals and schools and aged care facilities so that we would find that cars had to go slower and be quieter, that building sites could only be operational between particular hours. These are things that we now take for granted around schools, but it was in fact through groups like the Society for the Suppression of Unnecessary Noise that these things came to be. And it was about thinking about how we modulate our input. So in that case, it was the city and it was city noise. But for us, I think we need to think about how we modulate our input in terms of all of these forms of mobile and social data. Two current theorists, I think, are very interesting in terms of how they think about this. Adam Greenfield, recently of Nokia, uses the term zones of amnesty, and Genevieve Bell of Intel describes them spaces of refusal. And I think what they're suggesting here is that we need places and times and, in many ways, a, a personal ethic that will allow for moments of silence, that will allow us to occasionally be uncontactable and unhearing and unheard. In fact, 
Adam has this fantastic joke that I'm going to share with you, that he says that when he retires, he's going to set up a chain of cafes called Faraday's. And these cafes will be built inside Faraday cages, which would prevent any signals from entering the cafe. So Wi-Fi wouldn't get in, your phone wouldn't work, you would basically be completely and utterly silent, and that this would be blissful. And I think what's so interesting about this is it's complete contrast to the, you know, the love of internet cafes in the 1990s and the 2000s, that what we need for this decade is a space where we can be completely off network. And I think Faraday's would be a big hit. This is a photograph from Genevieve Bell's fieldwork in Korea. And roughly translated, this sign says, um, perhaps somebody can correct me, uh, more grace to you if you should turn off your mobile phone. And I think it's a lovely depiction of how we are already in the process of creating zones of refusal and spaces where we don't have to be online, we don't have to be connected, we don't have to be constantly reachable. The person who I think is still most relevant when we think about this is the media historian Jonathan Creary, who's looked at how this concept of attention and availability has changed since the 18th century. And in particular, in the late 19th century, how this problem of attention first emerged alongside with particular kinds of factory machinery. That, in fact, these were the very tools that were making people bored because they're sitting there, you know, on a factory line, were the very same tools that made people query this idea of attention. How could we make attention something that people could sustain for long periods of time? But what he observes is that this problem of attention has applied to every single media form. It is applied to books, it is applied to the radio, it is applied to television, and now, of course, the bad guys are the internet and mobiles. But in his words, we could actually think about modernity as being a series of ongoing crises of attentiveness, that there was always another thing that was trying to draw away our attention. But that in actual fact, what we can think about in terms of how we deploy our attention is that distractions can be highly productive. And this is something, again, that the Fluxus artists and the Dada artists were very interested in thinking about, is how distractions and noise can actually be sources of creativity and inspiration. So some concluding thoughts. I think by looking at the history from the 18th century to the 21st, we see this shared trajectory of information adaptation. And certainly in the people that we spoke to in our study, what we saw were these evolving cultures of media use and attention that were moving at an extraordinarily rapid rate. What tends to happen in this area is that we hear a lot about technological evolution, that it's you know, constantly happening very fast and possibly outstripping us. But what we found was something quite different. And by showing you a picture from 2001, I'm not trying to suggest that we're devolving but rather that we're experiencing a highly adaptive moment. That rather than just thinking about the ways in which technologies adapt, we need to look, analyze, and research how people are adapting alongside those technologies. So in the end, what we saw to draw on McLuhan's term that these complex media ecologies that surround us are changing at a rapid rate, but so are the uses of these technologies, and that people are finding their own adaptations, their own ways of engaging with mobile technology. And by talking about the social imaginaries with you tonight, I hope we've had a time to actually think about them seriously. I'm by no means suggesting that they're silly or not important. In actual fact, on the contrary, I think they point to lasting concerns that we have around privacy, trust, social connection, shifts in public and private life. And while young people are so commonly demonized in relation to technology, it again comes from a very long history where young people have commonly been used as the optic through which social change is debated and discussed. So I might finish up tonight with the big question of where next. For us, we're now moving into the quantitative mode of this study, so we will have all of the data for you by the end of the year, and we will then be releasing a report which will combine the qualitative and the quantitative data in the first quarter of next year. So if people are interested, by all means, uh, come and say hello, and I can keep you informed about our findings. But even sooner than that, where I'm headed in the next couple of weeks is here. To India, I'm working with uh, a media anthropologist and a team of researchers who will be looking at the use of mobile phones in India. And I think that this is a fascinating place to go after conducting the kind of study that we've had the grace to do in Australia. 
And why India is so interesting is because the mobile phone is such a present and important technology. As you can see from these numbers, access to a mobile phone, 617 million. Access to a toilet, 366 million. And what is so interesting about this, of course, is not just the disparity in particular kinds of infrastructure, but also the way in which the mobile phone has become such a present part of life in India. And I think here we see one of the big questions is how are different cultures and how are different communities engaging with what I think is one of the most profound metamorphoses of media cultures? Thank you.